Welcome to the Predictable Revenue Podcast, where sales leaders teach you what's working for them so you can build it yourself. This episode of the Predictable Revenue Podcast is brought to you by our sales coaching and consulting services. Are you looking to create repeatable, scalable, and predictable revenue? We've helped thousands of companies grow their business with tailored expert advice backed by testing to ensure they establish the best practices that will work for them. Head over to bit.ly forward slash predictable coaching to learn more. Welcome back to the Predictable Revenue Podcast. I'm your host, Colin Stewart. Today, I'm joined by Sri Ganesan. He's the founder and CEO over at Rocket Lane. And we are going to be talking about his early growth journey the first three years. Now, this is a little founder series that we've been doing. There is some really interesting stuff that you're doing in the kind of pre-launch that I think the founders are going to really like. There are There is some really interesting VC outreach stuff that we're going to get into um, in the middle of the episode that if you are in, if you're doing early sales uh, for a venture back startup, or if your company is thinking about raising, this is an amazing thing that you can steal. I'm not going to spoil it. Um, and then we're going to end land and talking about their event playbook and we got some little surprises in here that I'm really excited to talk about. But that, all that being said, Sri, welcome to the show. I'm super pumped to have you on. Thanks for joining us. Thank you so much, Colin. Happy to you know share our story, and uh, thanks for the opportunity. Oh man, um, it's an opportunity for me to learn from you. So I'm, I, I appreciate you coming on. Um, we're going to talk about the last couple of years. I want to start about pre, start with the pre-launch. So talk to me about. Um, your how you see category creation and if you're in sales and you're listening you're like why is he talking about category creation trust me this will be an interesting one because it helps you it'll help you understand sort of positioning and how to if your company doesn't have really strong product market fit or really strong positioning it'll help you figure out how to get there so that being said Sri, talk to me about your categorization playbook and what you did sure so uh rocket lane is my second startup journey and uh, both times we picked initial market to be uh, evangelistic market meaning people aren't looking for a product like this they don't know it exists and we're sort of along with creating a product also uh, trying to help define the category itself and you know this time this is more of a beachhead market for us we always knew that there is a wider market that exists that we want to expand into but it helps to start with a market that's a little more of a niche where you can truly establish yourself as the leader. And we picked client onboarding or customer onboarding as that market for us, where there were very few tools out there. There's a brand new category being uh, defined on G2 when we were launching. But long before that even happened, we started working on what, you know, when we last discussed, I chatted about as the category creation playbook. Now, um, where did the inspiration come for that? I, I would actually uh, want to thank Anthony Canada, one of the you know early team members and uh, uh, early CMO of uh, Gainsight. He actually wrote a book called Category Creation. I'd highly recommend entrepreneurs who are sort of creating something completely new to go and you know uh, read that book. Uh, and when I started, that was one of the first things I did. I knew this was new. Someone recommended the book to me, uh, read the book, and I, I thought, hey, most of the ideas in here, it's actually worth pursuing each of these ideas and making it happen. Um, i give you an example of a few things that we did. Month one, every weekend, I would actually spend on putting together, think of it as the outline of a book if we were to write a book on category creation, what would the chapters be? And what would be the key takeaways in each chapter? So I was actually, you know, looking for thought leadership content for us to help define that category. And every conversation I was having with, um, you know, prospect, uh, future po prospect or uh, anyone in the space, any expert in the space, was something I was diligently making note from on topics that we could add to the book, um, you know, what what would make for a good blog to read, good thought leadership article to write, etc. And I would say in in by month two, I had that outline well-defined, good write-up for each of the chapters. And actually, I would say also 10 pieces of thought leadership, which were sort of 80% there. I didn't 
bother to polish it, give it the right introduction, etc. But the core of the topic was already there. And one more thing we discovered while chatting with people in this space was there was so much nuance to how people were thinking about the customer onboarding journey and different phases, different stages of the journey that, mm. you know, we f- we found it, it would be useful to introduce these people that we were talking to, to each other, right? We felt they would benefit from learning from each other. Someone's doing a great job of how they run their kickoff meeting. Someone else is thinking through what should happen in a steering committee meeting for them to have faster success with customers they were onboarding. Someone else was figuring out how to de-risk the projects that they were running, how to have early warning signals. And we sort of said, hey, why not put all of these people in a space together, create a community, right? So we sort of, nine months before we launched a product, we actually launched a community, which I think, you know, you need conviction in the space for you to start doing these things early. But once you have that conviction that here's the audience I'm building for, let me start building the audience as well in parallel. Uh, That's something we did. So the community was growing. It was 700 people by the time we launched. Uh, And before that, we also had a podcast that we had. So we recorded, uh, you know, 13 episodes of content for the podcast before we launched. We had webinars, two webinars happening every month as part of the community. We called it implementation stories because these were leaders and, you know, practitioners of implementation slash onboarding as a function that we were chatting with. And... uh, genuinely started taking notes from each of these meetings and webinars, posting those notes on LinkedIn, uh, not on the blog yet, just as like a Notion document. So people understood that we were doing this out of the passion for learning and sharing in the space, not to build traffic to our website, right? And uh, eventually, of course, all of this content also made it to our blog and website. But uh, yeah, when we launched, the idea was how can we look much bigger than where we actually are, right? Someone, if, if they hit our website uh, the day of our launch, they would have thought, hey, this company must have been around for two years. They have a podcast, they have a community with like 800 people in it and uh, so much else, so much content uh, already posted, etc. I would say one more thing we paid attention to is the maturity of the website itself, right? So we wanted it to come across not as a, completely new product but as something that's been around for a bit so we we took care what was the vibe of the website was it hey we are a brand new startup or was it hey we are a mature player and uh, um, last but not the least I think the product itself we took a year to bake the product because we took a very different approach to even building product Uh, it wasn't an MVP that we launched we launched something that felt fairly full featured at launch it's also because in a new category we were think of it as uh, taking this approach of saying hey this is an all in one product for this uh, function of customer onboarding so we needed to bring together many pieces where people would have been using siloed tools for each of these and we can't launch something that doesn't do do justice to that vision um, so yeah these are some of the things that we really got going in early days and I, I love the um, the marketing maturity at launch idea I'm curious of all the things that you did where, where did those first couple of customers come from right so um, I had you know I had been constantly reaching out to people on LinkedIn uh, through our network of angel investors through you know, just cold connecting with folks on LinkedIn, et cetera, uh, on a regular basis, right? Like every week, I would sit, do my prospecting, do my outreach. Just tell people, hey, I have nothing to sell you yet, but I'm building something and I want your feedback, right? Uh, So I think people, when you say you have nothing to sell yet, it lowers their guard. Uh, You can actually, I used to tell them, we're at least six months away from launching anything, but I'd love to get your perspective on the problem space, right? And once we chat about the problem, they do get curious about the solution. So, you know, I built a list of around 120 companies that we could take the product to when we launch. Um, and that's that was my initial hit list, right? Like, let me go and 
you know, try to tell these people that, hey, we're now launched. Do you want to give this a shot? Uh, but we didn't necessarily stick to that plan because when we launched, we actually did a product hunt launch. We combined our funding announcement and the product hunt launch on the same day, which sort of played into each other because we got some news coverage. People went to the site. They saw that we were number one on product hunt. They went and upvoted as well if they liked the idea. So it sort of became, uh, you know, uh, uh, something that worked out well for us as a machine. So both were contributing to each other. And uh, we ended up being number one on product hunt that day. And a lot of people, I think more than 300 people signed up. 150 of those would have been of some seriousness, right? Like, I'm sure a lot of them were just checking it out. So this, not all signups were serious, but quite a few were people we could potentially sell to. So we started doing demos and that's actually where the first sales came from, not from that 120 list that I had. Interesting. Uh, yeah. And so, so the first couple of customers came from the product hunt, hunt launch, um, and not from not from customer development. How how did you know? Like obviously, Rocket Lane has done a pretty. I mean, you've done some really interesting things that we're about to talk about. But what gave you confidence that hey, this is the thing that we found? You know, this is the right thing, and and enough to you know, as you say, not just build an MVP, but build a pretty strong platform for day one. I think we spent a lot of time getting people to show us how they do their work today, right? So they showed us the complex spreadsheets and macros and whatnot that they were building because they were not happy with what's out there. They showed us the workarounds they were doing on existing apps, like building a Asana to Asana integration through Zapier because they wanted two versions of a project plan, one for their team internally, one for the customer they were implementing or onboarding, which had slightly different tasks. So watching people jump through the hoops to do things and really understanding their day, right? So we use an approach called jobs to be done to build product, which is similar to, for those of you familiar to familiar with Intercom, they championed this approach as well. So we followed that approach. And I think we did a great job of understanding truly what goes into the everyday of an implementation manager, of a team leader in this function, etc. What the board cares about, what a CEO cares about, uh, what an investor cares about, right? Because we saw that in SaaS, people were uh, measuring that time to value and they were anxious about closed ARR that was not turning to live ARR on time. And that told us a lot about the priority behind this problem gave us confidence that if we help solve the problem, it's going to be valuable to the company. And, you know, we had sort of understood problems at every level because of all the conversations we had. And as we started, when these were like Figma mocks, we started taking them to people saying, hey, here's the direction we're going. We don't have anything to sell yet, as I said before, but tell us what you think about this. And we were looking for what gave those wow moments from the Figma design itself, right? So we know what are they buying into really? What's, you know, making them pause and say, hey, wow, that's interesting. I haven't seen before. Yeah. And so what were those eye-popping moments? So that gave us a lot of clarity on what to build, uh, what to not, you know, what to not skimp on, right? Like we, we needed to be careful about what we're adding, what we're not adding, Uh while it was not an MVP, you still can't build everything, right? You still need to scope it in some way. Uh, so kept doing that and uh, started giving a few of those 120 companies talked about earlier. Uh, like five of them, we had given some early access to say, hey, uh, try this out, right? You know, some of them were, this was during COVID, but still we found, you know, time where, People were able to uh, make it out of their homes. We were able to sit and observe how they would use the product, what they struggled to do, what they like to do, so that that usability was also taken care of. And uh, mm -hmm. But before we pursued these companies to turn them into customers, the product and launch showed us a certain momentum that was happening from 
people who came inbound and i think that's always very powerful right like when some of these early teams come to you rather than you chasing them uh you're going to be able to close those accounts faster from a sales perspective uh because they sort of raised their hand and said hey i like what i see and show me more i have this plan yeah interesting and so i want to transition from you you got your first couple from the product hut launch you got confidence from the fact that you had done all this customer development and you found the wow mom- wow moments you found the you know hat tip to or secret note to founders if you see somebody doing what you're trying to solve and they're trying to solve it with a macro or a v lookup in excel or like crazy zapier integrations you've probably found you know some really interesting pain especially if that pain is worth you know some serious dollars if they've solved it you did something really interesting in the launch phase uh, around vc outreach can you tell me what it was and uh you know everybody who's you know in, in a founder level or uh in an early sales role at a venture back startup, I lean in and listen in because this is right. I think one of the things which I did in our last startup and continue to do till till today is be shameless and ask for help. Right, and uh, from a VC perspective, what this meant was so when we launched and we were number one on product hunt, there was a lot of inbound interest from VCs, and we had just announced our seed funding. So, you know, we were clear with them that hey, we're not raising now. but we'll still take the meeting with you and let's tell you what we do right like let's introduce ourselves and at the end of those calls once we described what we're doing what evangelistic market we are going after now uh obviously you know we just launched there was not much traction to show um there soon was but uh, even at that point we were like hey why don't you introduce us to these two or three portfolio companies that you know we feel could have a pain in this area so we did our research before every call on which two or three intros we wanted and we asked them to make those intros and we said hey you will learn something uh, based on their reaction right like if they like what they see and they buy you learned something about the real pain in this market so why don't you make those intros for us and many of them actually made those introductions which turned into early customers for us and in some cases the the you know these these folks didn't turn into customers immediately um like bigger companies i'm not going to name the brands but some of our best logos came from here they didn't come immediately but they remembered us when they had stronger pain in the area even like 6 months out 9 months out and then became customers so actually our the customer that helped us get over our you know 1 million arr mark exactly a year from launch was one of those introductions and like a great logo for us to have the the logo i'm most proud of winning till date amazing and it was all send in the um uh, going for asking for intros asking for help from the, from the vcs even though did you end up raising from any of them or was this just a potential channel for you we didn't uh end up raising from them uh we did keep in touch we still are in touch and you know you never know maybe we will uh raise from one of them in a you know future round uh but you know f- fundraisers are unpredictable someone else got in and did our series a uh but we did engage with these folks right we uh, have been a open uh you know we have been open with our growth and numbers with any of these folks who have been helpful uh to us in our journey and it's up to being you know we need to be at the right stage um and uh, right frame of mind for two companies to partner now the other thing we have done with vcs is actually send them updates from time to time so we actually use this product um uh, blanking on the name uh, it's called cabal c a b a l to stay in touch with our angel investors uh our existing investors vcs and uh potential future investors as well and even advisors friends of rocket lane all of them to keep sending them updates from time to time right like when there's a big moment for us we want a great logo or um you know reach to milestone uh or we are looking to reach a new milestone and we need help whatever it is we do push out communication to them and uh one of the cool things we did was uh december 2022 
we actually sent out a resume of Rocket Lane to around 400 investors. Now, you know, what we what the mail said is actually, hey, I know a lot of your portfolio may be hiring on their onboarding team or implementation teams uh, or professional services teams because by then we also started servicing professional services teams. But if they're looking to hire in 2023, you can maybe ask them to first hire Rocket Lane, the product, so that we can help make all of their team members more efficient and in the and effective in the job that they do. And uh, some of them actually passed it around to their portfolios. Some of them were just impressed enough that maybe when a next board meeting comes up and someone says they have a problem in the area, they would refer us. So I, I think staying top of mind helps and sending out those updates from time to time helps. And whether or not someone's going to invest in you, I think if they see that, you know, if you're impressive, right? If you make an impression on them, uh, they're going to remember you and they're going to help you where they can, uh, where they also feel it's going to benefit their portfolio. Totally. I, I'm curious, from a, just a email standpoint, did you, what did this resume look like? Was it you hand bombing out, you know, these uh, emails in Gmail and attaching a PDF? Did you automate it? Um, yeah, what did that look like? It was automated through Cabal, the tool I just talked about. So, yeah. Oh, okay. Got it. But it goes from my email. It goes as me. Yeah. yeah. Oops. I think I, I just revealed. Right. Just revealed. Just... <laughs> yeah. You, you did say, uh, you did say Cabal. I just, uh, I was, I was thinking through, was it a P, uh, was it a PDF uh, that you attached or was it just like the a PDF? Uh, would you be able to share? Would you be comfortable sharing that with uh, with the audience? Audience of people. Can- Absolutely. Let me update the resume as of February twenty twenty four, and send your resume. Fire fire us a link and we'll get it up. Uh, and feel free to link it on your home uh, somewhere on your site. And we'll just fire the link up there uh, to you. So if, if you're listening and you want to check it out, look at the show notes because uh, I I love this idea. I am a hundred percent going to steal this idea. Um, and there's there's one other. Uh, you know what, before I, I, there's one other idea of yours that I want to steal, but before I do, I'm curious, what was the impact of sending out this uh, resume uh, to VCs? As I said, you know, I'm sure it landed in some uh, portfolio inboxes. I don't have direct attribution of what happened from here, but it just helps us remain top of mind. It also gets a VC to send it to some portfolio companies just because they want to say, hey, look at what this company is doing. Maybe we should do it too to some of the portfolio companies they work closely with, right? Which may be in a similar stage. Hmm. So a lot of things we've done which are sort of novel, I think uh, it's not just about the resource as is being directly useful, but even if it gets shared within companies for just the novelty of it, uh, it brings attention to your company, right? Brings attention to the brand. And when uh, BDR reaches out to them, they're going to be like, hey, I've heard of this company. So I think there's impact in helping build brand uh, by doing these kind of activities rather than just look at the direct attribution from it. Yeah. Mm Mm-hmm. 100%. 100%. I think we see the same thing with uh, outbound, that the, you know, you see a correlation in the inbound or in the web, tra- web traffic and recognition pickup because people now, they, it's a brand impression, you know, and I think in the past people, mar- people in marketing were maybe not afraid is the right word, but thought there was going to be a negative uh, impression, but it's, what we're seeing is it's actually a slightly positive lift uh, for all things, even if you're not getting the greatest level of engagement. Uh, we definitely see an impact when we're not sending cold email on our inbound on all of our traffic, which is interesting. Yeah, I think, you know, uh, I've heard some modern outbound leaders talk about how it's not just direct appointment setting anymore, but how are you helping raise the awareness? How are you helping build an audience, a community around your brand? That's also how you get people to inbound, right? Like you, you're not just saying, hey, get a meeting with me, but you're also sharing links to useful resources, you're sending people on their way to your website or to a webinar or, you know, useful content that you've put out, uh, which will eventually turn into either getting an appointment set or 
inbound doing its trick. Uh, so it's it's also about, as you rightly said, raising that awareness. Uh, yeah, I, I think one more thing, and maybe this is the topic you're going to talk about, which came to mind for me was the rap song that we did. Um, so this was for our Series A announcement. Yeah. And this is not a cringe, you know, music video that a startup puts out. I would say, you know, check it out. And um, yeah, nah. it, yeah, it's actually a classy video. It was done on a $200 budget, but it wouldn't look like that. And uh, this actually went viral in a big way, right? Like we had 100,000 views on the first day uh, across like Twitter and YouTube and other channels. Uh, a VJ from MTV retweeted it, which again got us more attention. It, I don't know which channel, but some local TV network actually featured it in Startup News as a small segment. Uh, so we got a lot of eyeballs. But more importantly, many, many founder groups and marketing groups were buzzing with this video. And they were essentially saying, hey, why haven't we done this yet? Right? And that that was sort of yeah. leading to a lot of recognition for our brand. I'm sure there's a lot, lots and lots of marketers and founders who know of Rocket Lane, have no idea what we do, but I've heard of the name. And I'm trying to, I was just looking on your, um, on your YouTube right now. What was the name of the video? Just so I can throw a link to everybody in the show notes here. It's called Our Story yeah, so, so Far. So Far. That's the one. Okay, perfect. And if you're curious, I'm not going to spoil too much. It is not cringe. It's actually quite, quite well done. Highly recommend checking it out. Um, funny enough, that wasn't the, the first thing I was going to steal. Um, I was, I did want to bring up, um, I'm going to throw a link in the show notes to um if you're curious about jobs to be done it's just a method of describing the progress a customer is going to wants to make and nobody can describe this better than clayton christensen he's got a video about milkshakes um and uses it as a teaching mechanism for jobs to be done i, I won't spoil that either but you'll never look at milkshakes the same way again not in a bad way just in a it's a really interesting uh take on it the thing that i want to steal from you is your netflix idea oh yeah so talk to me about, this is the, and before we get into the event playbook, we'll get into that in a sec, but uh, tell me about uh, what you're doing, your uh, your Netflix style uh, video library. Yeah, so a few months back, I think a couple of months back, we launched Rocket Lane TV, which is a Netflix-like experience for content in our space, right? And I think, again, it's all about building an audience. So we use this, we, we found this, uh, company called Fast Picks, which actually was building, you know, Netflix style sites for regional content players in India. Uh, and we said, hey, would you be interested in making this product also work for SaaS companies that are trying to build an impressive like content repository? And we don't want it to be a boring, you know, here's our webinars kind of page. We want to actually make it like a true modern Netflix style ex immersive experience, right? Where people should want to go there and binge watch content in our space. So that was the idea. And uh, we, you know, one of our team members uh, got behind the idea and championed it, owned it. And this actually came out of like a simple random breakfast meeting on a holiday with our uh, lead designer, Arun, who's also the first employee, first team member to join us, right? Like a founding member of the team. Uh, it was just me and him catching up over breakfast and thinking about what could be something cool that we do this year. <laughs> and, you know, he said, Rocket Lane TV. And like, what do you mean? And, uh, you know, we went into the idea, found someone to build it for us. And, uh, yeah, I mean, super excited about how it's turned out. Uh, lots and lots of people consuming content over there, complimenting it, and again, sharing it, right? Like, uh, there, you know, there's people who are creating content so they can be featured on it. We have a TV show or movie style posters that we create for the content that we put it up on LinkedIn. So it gets a lot of attention over there as well. Um, I think it's just about the execution finally. And it looks like 
it looks shockingly a lot like Netflix. Like I, I log in and I'm like, oh, I'm expecting to hear that, but um, you've done a great job. Yeah, they're, they're coming up with the unique tone for our for our Netflix as well. I love it. I love it. Um, I appreciate the detour. I want to jump into the the scale side. So we've talked pre-launch in the category creation playbook. We've talked about the launch on Product Hunt, the VC outreach, and a couple other stuff. I kind of snuck in there because I'm greedy and I just wanted to I wanted to hear it all. Uh, talk to me about scale uh, now that you're scaling things up and your event playbook. Yeah, we have uh, two parallel motions running now. One is uh, SMB motion that's more inbound. So we are like the highest rated product on G2 in our category on in professional services automation and client onboarding. So that brings inbound automatically. Uh, so that's something we did focus on initially to drive happy customers towards putting their reviews on G2. So we can't control what they say, but we can push them to do those ratings. So we did do that very actively with them. Uh, and uh, we also spend on Google Ads. So those are the two ways in which we drive traffic to our website for the SMB side of things, right? Like, of course, we also are fairly active on social and we've created somewhat of a brand for ourselves. We run the community. All of that adds up. Uh, from a mid-market perspective, you've sort of bet big on events. So, uh, and I think we've done this for two and a half years now. So from a month before our launch, we started showing up at events. Uh, so initially it was the pandemic. So these were still online events that we, you know, started to sponsor and turn up at. But we've sort of evolved our playbook a fair bit. Uh, first thing I would say we, when we go in as a sponsor for an event, we usually don't go as a small sponsor. We don't want to look like the small player. So we do take up a big booth. Uh, we become one of the primary sponsors in any event we go to, uh, which also usually gives you the stage for having thought leadership session, right? And again, that's an area where we invest a lot of energy. Every four months or so, we come up with a new piece of thought leadership content that we're going to use in our events for, you know, the, the next four months. And uh, typically these are very actionable inputs, insights that we're giving people. So people know that we know what we're talking about. We're experts. We're not just, you know, trying to sell software, right? Usually it's nothing to do with our software. It's a lot of learnings from customers, learnings from, you know, us operating in this space, et cetera, rather than, uh, and, and tips and tricks of what they can do immediately. The goal for most of these sessions is, can you take away three ideas that you want to implement tomorrow for your team from the session? So that creates buzz around us. We have a big booth. We have great thought leadership. So people come to our booth, right? And mm -hmm. we have, we invest in really great swag. Uh, and I don't know if I mentioned this uh, the last time we spoke, Colin, but we also launched a swag store now. It's uh, store store dot rocket lane dot com, and uh, uh, that's because we know there is a lot of love for the merchandise we've handed out. Uh, it's all pretty creative. Um, so we have this laptop sleeve that's a huge hit. We have a desk mat that people use on their desk every day, right? Like there's, it's a beautiful big desk mat that they uh, lay out on their desk, and these are things that they're going to look at every day. So we think about what's an everyday use swag that we can give them uh, that's going to keep reminding yeah. them about us. Uh, one more swag which we did, which a lot of people sent us pictures of later, was this uh, onboarding game. So uh, think of it as, I think you folks uh, call it shoots and ladders, but in India it's called snakes and ladders. So we said, hey, this is the original <laughs> Indian version. Canada too. Okay. Snakes and ladders. And ladders. Okay. Yeah, yeah. 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 So... Uh, with with onboarding tips that will help you climb the ladder and malpractices that will bring you down the snake, right? So that that's something that people started playing with their kids. We expected them to play it with their yeah. teams, but uh, uh, they decided to teach their kids onboarding sooner than later, right? So hey, there you go. so that was fun, and uh, uh, people come for the swag. One of the tricks again there was. We handed out these nice uh, tote bags as well. 
and people want the tote bags to collect other swag too so uh, if we hand out these totes and and swag aggressively in the beginning of the day then automatically more people see it and they then come and find you so now you have people coming to the booth uh you have an attraction in the booth typically so once we had a massage chair which really worked well uh but another thing we've done recently is popcorn uh because the smell wafts and people you know want to come get it uh that's a great idea yeah and uh so people come to the booth uh we start with a conversation about our mascot uh felicity who's a space kitty so this was actually a kitten that was found on the streets of paris sold to the french space agency the first animal to make it to space and come back safely we believe uh and uh, so we we ask people to listen to the story first before they collect the swag and then they're curious about rocket lane we show them a demo uh on the spot if they're interested what we're going to do is not say hey let me scan your badge and chase you later but we tell them hey we don't want to scan your badge send send you and then bombard you with emails or phone calls we'd rather just put time on the calendar now and love it get them to open their calendar book a time slot right there and you know then we don't need to worry about the follow up after the event so that's been a really good thing that we managed to do now the only uh you know thing is there's some events for example saster where a founder comes out to the event and they're like hey i need my customer success leader to look at this or i need my professional services leader to look at this right and they're going to say mail me i'll connect you and they're not going to respond to those emails because they have hundreds of emails hitting their inbox so what we instead get them to do is we came up with this qr code we tell them hey i want to try something on you why don't you scan this qr code when they scan the qr code it auto populates an email from them with me in the cc or our sales leader in cc and the email content says hey i met this really innovative company that's doing some cool things in psa and onboarding i told them you'll take this meeting you know take a look right and and they just need to fill in the email of the person uh, on their team they're going to find this a little cheeky but we tell them that up front I, you know feel free to modify the content but we thought this would be a nice way to get, get them to love that so most of them appreciate the hustle and they actually send it out i love that um i'm definitely stealing that idea um i'll, I'll give you one back that you can you can use um cuz i i feel the same at boost if all you're trying to do is scan uh batch scan batch scan batch scan well I'll tell you the story for, we were at the first saster we did almost all of them up until the pandemic um the first couple of sasters we were scanning hundreds of badges under the badges never got any business from it i was frustrated i was about to cancel saster and i thought you know what let's give it one more chance um but we got to if we're going to do it we're going to do it differently and so uh, the the what we came up with was a uh, postcard size um pa- pieces of paper that we'd get printed out on postcard stock that had our qualification questions on it and it was just four quadrants with goof, goofy pictures and we could just check 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 and then we had name email and next step and we thought hey let's run this but we won't scan any badges if we have any conversations the goal the rule is you got to pull this out and uh, and put it in front of the customer and start filling it out and we went from a scenario where we scheduled or we had 320 something badge scans the previous year and we got 37 of these AWF are we fit cards filled out and of the 37 almost all of them turned into opportunities and of all the 37 opportunities i think we turned 8 7 or 8 into customers within 30 days or within 90 days and then i think we got five more over the next year pretty so, cool all from just a postcard and what we found is that the the what was the big difference is one it reminded us that hey we're at a trade show but we're also here to have a conversation so have a look at the card and like here are your prompts because it's so easy to get into like talking about all this stuff mode and forget all the best practices that we know um especially if you're bringing you know more junior folks to the show and they're not you know your your senior closers or your VPs or your directors or anything like that but number 2 it helped the customer see that hey this is a sales conversation and 
they would turn around and stand next to us and be like, oh, that, yeah, we have this. Oh, no, we don't have that. And all the good, all of them tended to have notes on the back. And what we were getting is we brought for the second year was a stapler because we were getting business cards and uh, we would staple the card in there. We'd take a picture of it. Um, and then we would, on when we finished filling out the card, we would obviously book a next step uh, with the prospect if we could at the time. And if we couldn't, then at least we had their phone, email, it, business card. Um, and they had had this experience and it was a standout experience because most companies just want to scan your badge or give you some free swag. And this is one of those pattern interrupts where it's like, hey, I came to the PR booth and I actually got a good conversation. That was our swag. It was a really cheeky, cheap way of saying we didn't buy anything for you. <laughs> Sorry. Nice. But we did bring a fortune teller in to uh, attract people to the booth. That was hilarious. Yeah. Very interesting. Fortune teller is something sort of our style. So you probably try it out in the future. We've uh, done huge, you know, around uh, uh, Halloween every year, we do this on social media where we say, these are your horror scopes. And uh, we have uh, something of a horror story around onboarding uh, that, that, you know, we put out for each of the sun signs. I love that. Horror scopes. Oh, man. I feel like we could just stay on here all day and chat uh, geeky uh, marketing and sales tactics. Um, I really appreciate you coming on and, and sharing with us. I really enjoyed learning. We definitely want to have you back and we can talk about, you know, what this year and the next year kind of looked like um, and come back and check in on some of these things and some of the progress and some of that. I'm just curious to see how the Netflix idea goes and see what you guys come up with next. In the meantime, you know, we're going to have a bunch of links to Rocket Lane, but if people are, they haven't figured it out by now, What's the best way for them to think about Rocket Lane um, and what's the best way for them to get in touch? Right. So the way to think about Rocket Lane is if you have a project or an initiative that you need to run with a customer, whether it's a services project of some sort or an implementation project, like you're a SaaS company, you need to run those implementations or follow on professional services. Or even as a customer success team, you need to collaborate with the customer, hold each other accountable. Rocket Lane is a way for you to do it with a portal on your own brand, uh, which is going to be like success.companyname.com or services.companyname.com. Uh, make things transparent to the customer. This is an all-in-one portal. So your project plan, your tasks, your documents, meeting notes, status updates, uh, surveys, CSAT, everything goes in there. So it becomes a beautiful way to have this all-in-one spot for your collaboration with the customer. And uh, even a services company, a marketing agency, uh, a system integrator, uh, a, you know, I, consulting firm, anyone can use it, right? So that's the product. So we also have native time tracking, resource planning, uh, rate cards, so that in a, in a year like 2023, 2024, finance teams want to understand what is the cost of each of these projects? Are we having a positive or at least net neutral margin on implementing customers so it helps you with all of that financials as well and best way to reach out to us uh, i am at sri at rocketlane.com i will respond if you write to me but of course you know go to rocketlane.com you can book a demo with our team as well beautiful and we'll have a ton of links in the show notes in case you want to see their uh rocket lane tv or their netflix uh style they'll we'll have the um the link to the the video the rap video that they did and the link to the um the job, the job posting, not job posting, sorry, the resume that you've done for the product, which is amazing. Sri, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thanks uh, for having me on, Colin. Thank you. Right on. Thanks everybody for listening. We'll see you all next week.